This is episode 103 with Patrick Bet David. Hi, I'm Ted. And this is Arlene. Our guest today is Patrick Bet David. Patrick is the CEO of PHP Agency. PHP Agency Inc. is a national financial services marketing company uh, with a compelling two part vision change the culture and diversity of the insurance industry and build the world's largest financial service marketing company in history. He's well on his way. Patrick formed the agency 10 years ago to bring life insurance to multicultural middle class America while at the same time bringing an entrepreneurial opportunity to individuals in those communities. He is also the host of Valuetainment. Really like that, by the way. The number one channel on YouTube for entrepreneurs. He produced a video that got over 31 million views on Facebook called The Life of an Entrepreneur in 90 Seconds. One of his episodes is, we're going to make it cool to be a life insurance agency. It's one of his quotes. The company's motto is, bringing back life to the insurance industry. Patrick, welcome to Spot on Insurance. It's good to be on with you. It's very good to be on with you. Now, I've never met an entrepreneur who's had an it easy. So, Patrick, tell us about that kid with dreams and how your life unfolded as a result of those trials and tribulations you've had to endure. Yes, I was born and raised in Iran. I lived there for 10 years. I was born uh, three months before the Shah was in exile, so October 18, 1978. And I lived there till Khomeini died, which six weeks after he died, July 15th of 89, we escaped, went to Germany, lived at a refugee camp in Germany for two years. And then from Germany, we came to the States, lived in Glendale, California, went to school. And then right after high school, I joined the Army uh, at the 101st Airborne Division Air Assault, and then got out of the Army, met a girl named jean Vier, who was uh, working at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. We started dating, and she would always pick me up in a different car. And I was working at that time at Valley Total Fitness. I was trying to be the next Middle Eastern Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, I was going to be a bodybuilder, marry a Kennedy, go into Hollywood, you know, and then become a businessman, politics, all this stuff. And uh, this girl completely changed it because I went into Morgan Stanley Dean Witter immediately at 21 years old. Uh, I got, um, first day I was hired at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter was a day before 9-11. 9-10 was a Monday. 9-11 is a Tuesday. Monday was my first day. I get in. I'm about to go to New York for my training because Morgan Stanley's headquarters based out of the World Trade Center. And then obviously we all know what happened. I went to San Francisco for training instead of New York. Stuck in the financial industry with Morgan, went to another company, did a lot of good things there, had a good time with them. And in October of 09, uh, I uh, made a decision to leave and start our own company called PHP with 66 insurance agents based out of Northridge, California. And we grew that from 66 to 9,600 today in 49 states, and uh, we now have uh, De La Hoya as one of our investors, Gabriel Brenner at Alaya Fund uh, out of New York, which is a $2 billion fund, and we went from doing 100 life insurance policies per month to now we'll do around 6,000 insurance policies this month. Fantastic. Incredible. Just for impact's sake, how old were you when you decided to start this? I was 30 years old. I was a 30-year-old insurance CEO, and I would go to these conferences with other CEOs, everybody in the, you know, the insurance industry, so filled with 59 year old white males. And I'm a 30 year old Iranian CEO, which makes no sense. And by the way, our, our conferences, if you come to our convention, like last year, our convention was at the Venetian, our entertainment for the night was Kevin Hart, mm -hmm. he did a, a, a performance. And the average agent in our company is a 34 year old Hispanic female. The average age in our company is a 34-year-old Hispanic female. And uh, so it's a complete different type of uh, environment. We have very, very different. It's nothing, nothing about it is traditional when you take a look at it. So kind of before we just get into our deep dive topic, we'll, which will going to definitely be on the economic outlook, which we can't wait to jump on that. Let's chat insurance first. Your company, you've talked a little bit about the numbers. You've grown it to 7,000 life agents. You're in 49 states. You're serving over 100,000 families. What were the early challenges in creating your agency in 2009? Great question. So by the way, we're at 9,600 agents. The number you're looking at is from a year ago. But the early, challenges, the early challenges that we had, I would say 
I had no idea what it was to be a CEO. I was clueless. So I went from, you know, the whole transition that we go through. It's five transitions, right? You go from being an employee to a salesperson. So most people don't know how to go from being an employee to a salesperson because most people don't know how to sell and work on commission because it's not easy. And if you don't sell, you don't pay the bills. And then eventually the wife or the husband says, honey, you got to go get a job because you're not making money here. And so that's why there's a 90% turnover ratio with anybody that gets into real estate, insurance, mortgage, anything that is a commission-based environment. So if you learn how to go from employee to sales, not every employee makes a good salesperson. Then you have to go from being a salesperson to learning how to lead a sales organization, like a sales leader, broker. You're running your broker shop, you got 40 real estate agents, 20 insurance agents, whatever it is, right? That's a different mindset. And you'll hear typically a lot of people say the following phrase. The phrase is, you know, I just don't like babysitting people. You, you ever heard that before? I'm not a fan <laughs> of babysitting people. Absolutely. I, I but that's part of being a sales leader. And then after sales leader, you have to learn how to be a business owner, assistant, staff, operations, support, technology. You know, what can you do that's not being touched by hands, that it's completely automated. And then from there, it's thinking like a CEO. And most people don't think like a CEO. And so I had a mission to go figure out how to um, be a CEO. Initially, I put all my money into the company. So I never raised money until my, we didn't raise money until the eighth year of the business. Actually, we didn't raise money until the fifth year of the business. The Silicon Valley investor came in fifth year. We paid his investment back within a year and a half. And then our second investor came in uh, on the eighth year of the business when they came in August of last year, 2017 is when they came in. So I put all my money into it. It was all my money. And I had saved it up. I was 30. I'm like, here's my half a million. It's going in. And um, so once I, once I really became curious about not just working in versus on and what it is to become a CEO, I'm a guy that needs to have a clear, uh, a clear philosophy on how to do things. So I became very clear about this. And this is the formula I put up and I came up with. There are two things that we think about as CEOs and as business owners. Most people put so much emphasis in areas that helps the company grow linear, not exponential. Linear is when you're constantly focused on biz debt, which is shaking hands, you know, oh my gosh, let me go meet the wholesaler here, this other guy here, let me go to this Nalba event, let me go to NIFA, let me go to this biz debt, biz debt, biz debt, biz debt, biz debt, biz debt. Good, but it's not exponential. It's simply a linear growth. And then the other area that we do is operations. You know, hire staff, technology, home office, HR, that doesn't explode your business, that sustains your business. It's linear, okay? The area that helps your business grow exponentially is two things. One is the next innovative campaign. And innovative campaigns are ongoing. Innovative campaigns are not one will work forever, one will work in every season. For instance, a few years ago, I think Mitsubishi uh, did an innovative campaign that was brilliant during the time where gas prices went to $5 a gallon, if you remember this, Mitsubishi came out and say, if you buy a Mitsubishi right now, we will pay you gas for one year. That was <laughs> oh my gosh, babe, they're going to pay our gas for a year. I remember that. <laughs> and everybody's buying Mitsubishis. They have no clue why they're buying Mitsubishis. You call that a brilliant next innovative campaign. Brilliant next innovative campaign, right? So the next innovative campaign means every month you have to be prepared on the fourth week of the month What's your next innovative campaign for the month of March? So you gotta be able to launch it on the first. You know, what is your next innovative campaign for this quarter, for the year? You're constantly looking for next innovative campaigns because whatever energy you want, that innovative campaign has to produce that energy. Meaning, if you want competition, that innovative campaign has to produce competition. If you want urgency, that innovative campaign has to produce urgency. Whatever you want, that innovative campaign produces that, right? So. That has to do with numbers, data, knowing your seasons. Like we, we had terrible seasons for June, July, August. And I'm sitting there saying, why do we suck during the summer season? Well, because Mr. CEO, you don't have a great innovative campaign for June, July, August. All of a sudden, four years ago, I came out with this next innovative campaign. Our summer seasons killed it. Yes, sir. We went, <laughs> we went through that. Yes. Yeah. So you know what I mean by that. And then, Absolutely. And then the last one is leadership development. Very simple. You know, you can... You give me a country that grows, I'll show you a country that develops uh, uh, leaders. You give me a church that grows, I'll show you a church that develops leaders behind closed doors. I had a guy 
Uh, I used to be an atheist for 25 years. And one time this one guy called me. I used to debate everybody. I was so like, oh, my gosh, I can debate everything you want to debate. Let's go debate it. And so one time they said, I want you to meet this pastor. He knows everything about the Bible. You ask him any scripture, he knows it. I said, come on. I'm telling you. So I go to his church, and I meet him before. And I said, so I hear you know everything about the Bible. And like the back of your hand, yes, anything. I said, Galatians 1.6 gave it to me. Psalm such and such gave it to me. You know, the, uh, Corinthians, there was not, I tested him 10 times. He knew everything. <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe this man, 60-year-old man, knew the entire books, everything. Verbatim, he knew it. And then I went and saw his church. His service only had 100 people there. Church has been on for two, 20 years, only 100 people. Why? Because he's not a leader. Right. He does not develop leaders. So just because you know everything about annuities, insurance, products, da, 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 just because you know doesn't mean you're a great developer of leaders. You have to understand the idea of developing leaders. So one of the mindsets we have in a company for everybody, no matter what department here, you get bonuses based on you replacing yourself. I bonus you based on you replacing yourself. So if you find somebody that cannot do your work, you're showing security for the company. Here's a bonus. You're a good leader. You replace yourself. So once I figured out that formula, linear exponential, it was game over from there for me. Very good. You know, uh, Arlene and I went through something similar in that we were stuck in the beginning. Uh, she's the regulatory compliance side. I'm the computer geeky side. And she did not want to let go of her expertise and share it. And I was like, the only way that we're going to grow as a company is if we develop other people and that are better than me. And I said, everything <laughs> that you have in your brain has to go in there and we've got to make it work. And that's what we did. That's, that's what, what did allowed us to now today, 21 years later, uh, live in Puerto Rico. I had to hold team. her upside down and shake <laughs> it out of her, but you know, I Thank love you, that. Ted. Thank you. <laughs> so today we're going to be talking with Pat about the outlook of the economy. So, Pat, you've obviously learned how to ride the roller coaster. You started your insurance agency during one of the bleakest financial crises in our lifetimes. So, let's jump right in and start a discussion on how we prepare for the market for the crash. For the next the imminent one. market crash. Let's do it. It's probably in the car. Let's do it. Let's yeah. get into it. Let's do it. So, um, give us a bit of the history of the trends of the market. Yeah. So every ten years, <coughs> every ten years we have a massive crisis. Every ten years, no matter what we do, something happens. Every five years we have a small crisis. Every ten years we have a massive crisis, and it's just inevitable. You know, one of the I was just shooting a video right now, uh, and the video is titled, you know, why entrepreneurs must study stoicism. The one thing about Stoics, like we're talking Zeno, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, or Seneca, one of the things about the way these guys thought was the fact that they immediately, they have this thing called the negative visualization. What is negative visualization? You automatically go to the worst case scenario that what could happen. What's the worst case that could take place? And, and you, when you go there, you literally grab a piece of paper. Okay, you get your two or three people in the room, or by yourself if you're you know, all by yourself, you don't have a big team yet. If I make this decision, what is the worst case scenario that's going to take place? And you start writing and writing and writing and writing. This could be a few hours, by the way. Writing, 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 writing. And then you ask yourself, well, you know, is the reward so high where the risk is worth taking? No. So why are we doing this? I don't even want to do this. Is the reward so high so the risk is worth taking? Absolutely. Then that's fine. Then let's take it. But maybe the risk isn't that high that I'm going to lose everything, but I still want to do it. Then I have to create areas that I anticipate if things happen because, <coughs> because it lessens the pain. It lessens the load when it takes place. So, for, exa for example, for us, when we started uh, uh, the company, it was right after 2008 market crash, you know, 38%. You know the whole numbers. It was pretty you know it well. <clears throat> horrible. And I was in the securities business and I'm a branch office manager. So I'm serious seven, 66, 31, 26 life and health. I mean, I, I got them all. And uh, all of a sudden, boom, we sold 7,000 VULs. You know, when you sell 7,000 VULs, you guys know what happens with that. You know, market crashes, minimums are now high payments, all this other stuff. And I sat there and I said, 
study the marketplace on what's going on. I wrote a book called The Next Perfect Storm based on five things I saw. Very simple. Five things I saw, okay? So then I started looking at this saying, okay, here's where the opportunity is. If you look at what's going on today, Ron Paul in 2004, he was in his late 60s. Ron Paul, he was 69 years old, maybe 70 years old. In 24 hours, raised $6 million on MySpace for his campaign. What do you mean a 70-year-old raises $6 million in 24 hours on MySpace? That was a Guinness Book of World Record. Well, guess who saw it? The guy who saw it was the guy that gave that speech at the Democratic National Commission, DNC, the senator, the one-term senator. And he said, game is changing, social media. Barack Hussein Obama became mm -hmm. president. Okay, very simple. Because you understood that. So I'm watching everyone. I'm like, oh my gosh, look what just happened over there. Obama raises nearly $2 billion. The guy that was the best campaigner of all time prior to him was Bill Clinton. And he did it without the internet. This guy raises $2 billion. Are you kidding me? Two-term president. Following him, the guy that became president. Master, master on Twitter. Master at getting all media to study every single one of his tweets. Master. The media doesn't realize this. They got him elected. They of got course. him because they watched it, but he understood social media. They so couldn't take their eyes off of him. I started studying this whole thing and I said, you know what? You know, this is happening no matter what. So my game plan was more on knowing what I could bank on, no matter what the worst case is going to take place. So what can I bank on? Good thing about insurance is insurance is recession proof. If you think about it, depending on the product you sell, some products you sell, you are going to be hit by recession, but some products you sell in insurance, it is recession proof. So you're not really necessarily looking at a product that, you know, it's, it's like this, 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 right? That's the stock market. That's real estate. I don't want to be able to deal with the stock market. Every time market goes up, somebody else calls me. Every time market goes on, somebody else calls me. I'm asking 600 calls in a day and I haven't made any new money. I don't want to do that. Insurance you sell, you maintain, you build a relationship, it sticks on the books. If you do your part to keep that client on the books. And so I looked at the market. I said, okay, millennials. 80 million. Boomers was 76 million. Millennials, 80 million. Beautiful. Great market. No one knows how to speak their language. Most boomers, the way they talk to millennials is, why are you so lazy? Why don't you get it? Do you not understand that life is more serious than this? Get off the damn phone. What are you always on Facebook for? Why are you on social media? Who cares about Snapchat? That's millennials. You can't say anything to them. It's like back in the days when they would say, why do you dance like Elvis Presley? That's bad. You're shaking your hips too much. You're going to get too much attention. <laughs> you know, why are you watching so much listening to radio? It's not good. Don't listen to this track. Don't watch this TV. Right now we have social media. And so I saw that and I saw a lack of understanding for them. I said, perfect. I understand them. I'm going to be fine here. Then I saw multicultural was the next one. I noticed uh, people don't realize the power of minorities and immigrants. They don't understand it. They don't understand the power, legal immigrants. They don't understand it, that, you know, the power of them. They don't see that. They don't understand the fact that, like, I don't know many Latinos that don't work hard. Some of the hardest working people I know that I've met in my life are Latinos. But Latinos, sometimes they don't think big. They, they think small sometimes. Because to them, the whole thing is, at least I'm in America. That's a victory in itself. Mm. No, we got to go two more steps ahead, right? That's it's like right. veteran. I'm a military guy. I got out. I was a small thinker. At least I have benefits. You know, at least I have, you know, such and such. At least I have the GI Bill. No, that's small thinking. America offers you to think as big as you want to think. Yeah. You know, th there's a reason why they call America the American dream. They don't call it. No other country in the world is called whatever, whatever dream. They don't call it the Russian dream, the China dream, the Japanese dream, the German dream, the Brazil Brazilian dream. They only call it the American dream. Only. The number one country in the world leading with immigration is America, 41 million. Number two is Russia at 10 or 11 million. And the reason why it's Russia is because that whole Ukraine thing. So it's not really people are going to Russia. It's just a numbers mix up, but people come to America. And so I saw millennials. I saw minorities. I saw immigrants. I saw those combined together. And I saw the average age being where it was at. I said, we're going to make it sexy again. So when we went, we went into it, we saw those social media things all combined together. And that's how we went from where we were at to where we're at today. So tell us, how do insurance agents, because I mean, you know, you're forecasting uh, things in the economy that are going to happen. 
in the near future? How do insurance agents and everyone else out there prepare for what's coming in the market, in the economy? So why don't we talk about that? Why don't we talk about that? So I just talked about this uh, uh, yesterday in Jamaica. We had a couple hundred of our executives in Jamaica, and we just got back uh, late last night, and I talked about this on these last few trips we've had in uh, – uh, conferences we had. We had a 2,500 people in San Diego two weeks ago. We had 2,000 people in San Antonio, another one with 505 people, and we're kicking off. We announced our big event in May, no, in mm-hmm. July. We sold out our tickets in one week. 9,800 tickets sold at $200. Event sold out, right? And that's going to be in July. Oh, you'll see who our keynote speaker is. We haven't announced it to the field. I know who it is because we're in negotiation with contract. The industry is going to flip on when they hear who I'm announcing. But anyways, let me tell you what it is. So here's, here's how I look at it. Here's how I look at it. I grew up in a family where my mother's side, they were communists. They hated rich people. My mother's concept was rich people are greedy. Mm-hmm. And my mother's side, they, my father's side, they believed in imperialism, the Shah. They believed poor people were lazy. So you got two different mindsets here. Rich people are greedy. Poor people are lazy. These two mindsets, right? What a combination. Exactly. <laughs> what a combination, right? So I'm sitting there and I'm listening to these guys debate. Then I saw what happened to Iran. I saw exactly what happened to Iran. Iran had a revolution, the ro- largest revolution in the history of mankind. Nine million people revolted in Iran. And what was the message behind the revolt? It was very simple. A man named Khomeini went out there and said the following. He said, why is it? That so many Iranians, we have oil, we have everything. Why can't we take this oil back from the Shah and we take the money and we give you free food, free homes, free phones, free everything? Why don't we do that? We should be able to do that. We are so rich in the Middle East. And, ta, 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 ta. and Iranians are like, man, this makes sense. And his tapes started spreading like wildfire. Everybody was listening to this man's tapes from France. He was recording in Paris and would make it into Iran. And the Shah didn't think anything was going to happen. Boom. The fall of Iran. And by the way, in the 70s, the top three countries in, in tourism in the world, Iran was one of them. Frank Sinatra would party in Iran. The ambassador of Iran would date Elizabeth Taylor. It was crazy stuff that was going on. If you, really, if you really wanted to go party in a country, you went straight to Iran. The best caviar, best food, exotic, beautiful, gorgeous women that were there from Russia, from Iran. Everybody wanted to go to Iran. 79, everything changed. So what's my point here? Listen, Trump is president today because of Barack Obama. Very simple. Barack Obama became president because of Bush. Very simple. Bush became president because of Clinton. Very simple. Clinton became president because of Senior. Senior became president because his president that he worked for, that was vice president for, everybody loved. Reagan won 49 out of 50 states. So his vice president became the exchange, and he became president. Before Reagan, it was Carter. Before Carter, it was... uh, who was before Carter? I think it was Ford. Before Ford, it was Nixon. Before Nixon, it was JFK. So you see it's going like this, right? So it's a pendulum swinging back and forth. Not all the time. So you and I cannot be naive. Again, it goes back to negative visualization and anticipation, right? Okay. So who today is having the same amount of momentum in America like Trump had four years ago? Think about it. What name? If you were to say what one name in politics is getting massive surge, in America today, what name would you say it is? Non-Trump, what name would you say it is? I'm so curious to know what you, and this has to do everything with insurance, by the way, everything. What do you think that name is? Hmm, you're not talking Warren. She's one of them, who else do you think it is? Uh, New Jersey, he used to be the mayor of New Jersey. Cory Booker. Booker. Cory Booker. Okay, let me tell you who it is. None of them are getting the kind of momentum that AOC is getting. Alexandra. Oh, yes, 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 Ocasio. Let me put it to you this way. She is the reason why Amazon didn't end up in New York. Let me say this to you guys. Let me simplify this for you. New York was getting ready to give Amazon 3.2 billion. Yeah. Amazon was going to give New York City $22 billion in 10 years. You're making $19 billion if Amazon moves to the city of New York. 25,000 jobs at a minimum income of 150, average salary of 150. Let me say this again. Hmm. 25,000 jobs at $150,000 a year salary. And she gets up and she said, we can't have Amazon bully New York because if they come, rental insurance is going to go up. 
and rent's going to go up. And what are the poor people going to do? And people said, yes, let's pull them out. That's Amazon pull out. And Amazon said, no problem. We're out of New York. We'll go to Virginia. 20,000, 20, 25,000, we'll put 5,000 in Nashville. The governor of New York said, what the hell are you guys doing? What are you talking about? But do you know why she has so much momentum? Because 80 million voters are millennials. Very simple. Mm. Today, Economist came out with an article saying 51% of millennials would vote for socialism today. What's my point to you here? This is my point to you here today. The same way Obama gave birth to Trump, Trump is going to give birth to somebody on the complete opposite side. Hardcore. Now, I'm not saying a little bit, a lot of it. What does this mean? You got two to six years, give or take. Let's just say, yeah, two to six years. Because if he gets reelected at six years, five years, if he doesn't get reelected, he got 18 months, whatever the timeline is. When it comes to the other side getting reelected, the younger generation is going to be voting them in. Okay, and she knows how to rally. The younger generation is going to vote. The only reason Bernie Sanders didn't get elected is because of super delegates. Let's not forget that. If Bernie Sanders yes. wouldn't lose those super delegates to Hillary, his president taxes are 70%. Just so everybody knows this. America's about to be shell-shocked when they get to 70% taxes in the next six years. And no one's going to realize it. Products is going to be regulated. Insurance is going to be regulated. You, you can't get paid that much commission. You have to disclose this. You have to disclose that. Everything, this is going to be taking place. It's inevitable. We are going in that direction. So when we go into that direction, what do we need to do? Well, actuaries and product developers have to start thinking about the products they're going to design. They have to already anticipate, if that happens, do you have a product that meets all their guidelines to get approved? So when it does happen, agents are still going to stay in. Look what happened to the health insurance industry. What happened to the health insurance industry? Boom! Disappeared. Why? Nationalized insurance. Commission went from 15% to 7% to nothing. How do you want me to pay my bills? <laughs> Boom! Everybody's leaving the health insurance business. So the, the point I'm trying to make to everybody here is, is to realize and not be naive when it comes down to voting. When it comes down to voting, we cannot be naive. On one end, we cannot be naive when it comes down to that. And by the way, I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I voted left and I voted right. I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm purely independent. But when there's, if there's one thing we all have in common is, is when it comes down to the economy. Is the one thing we have all in common is economy. You can be pro-life, pro-choice, gay marriage, no gay marriage, whatever you want to be thinking about. The one thing that we all have to realize is economy leads the way and allows you and I to keep creating jobs. And when one side gets elected, they're driven by over-regulation. Over-regulation hurts our industry. That's one. So sometimes the insurance industry is blind when it comes down to which side they vote for. They realize... They vote this side and they don't realize that's exactly the side that's hurting them with the regulation. That's one. And by the way, I'm free, very comfortable to talk about this because what are you going to say to me? You know, I'm Middle Eastern from Iran. You know, I have every single anomaly where you can't say anything about me. I, you know, what are you going to say? You know, mm -hmm. I'm the same height as Bin Laden. I have the big nose of a Middle Eastern. I have these <laughs> ears, I have facial hair. So all that stuff doesn't apply to somebody wanting to drive me up. So one, we have to be aware when it comes down to voting. Two is, knowing that that's going to happen, you have to have so much urgency the next five years to make millions and save it. You have to have so much urgency the next five years to make millions and save it. Because if you don't save it, that is going to be the longest four to eight year stretch of your lifetime when that day comes. Longest four to eight year stretch of your lifetime when it comes. Inflation goes up, all this stuff happens. I mean, we've seen right. what's called Venezuela, one and a half million percent inflation. The average Venezuela lost 24 pounds last year. I don't need to tell you anything that you haven't seen online. It's the direction that it could go to if we're too naive about it and we don't see these things taking place. So for me, I like to think about the next six, seven worst case scenarios that happen and then we adapt and then we adapt and then we adapt, we prepare. So that's a bit of the mindset on what I'm seeing taking place with you. And by the way, here's what you need to realize. I could be wrong about everything I said, but I'm very comfortable believing that all this stuff is possible to happen in the next two to six years. Well, you know, we've seen this in history. It's constantly, uh, it's got to come down at some point. And you mentioned a percentage in one of your videos, 74% is the up. And then the other percentage is when you've got a stock market having problems. And how many years have we had of a straight positive growth? Yeah. What is it, seven, nine? 
hundred and uh, hundred and sixteen months to be exact, and the record is one hundred and twenty one months. So we're we're very close to that, and and you're hearing the word you, you're hearing it on the internet all the time from from different people. So we are getting ready, and the best way to do it is. As you said, look at that worst case scenario and prepare for it. So yeah. one question I have for you, Patrick, is let's say you're an insurance professional today and you're concerned about your career in the future. How do you protect your career today? What is some, what's some of the steps that you can do to protect your career? Specialize, become an expert ASAP in one or two areas. Specialize and become an expert ASAP in one or two areas. You cannot be a jack of all trades. Like, you know, these guys that say, oh, I do life and I do this and I do PNC and I do, you know, uh, uh, you know, such and such and I do securities and I do real estate and I do mortgages. You're going to get crushed. Right. When you do that. So That's find a- your specialty, find oh, your yeah. niche and become an expert. Um, another question, any insurance uh, conferences that you're going to be going to in 2019 or any conferences in general? No, but I am hosting a conference my day, myself that's not a PHP conference at all. You guys, you know, I have a YouTube channel with 1.7 million, 1.17 million subs, a billion minutes watched, and it's the number one channel for entrepreneurs. If you go type an entrepreneur on YouTube, you'll see a bunch of videos. Already done. I've already yeah, listened to some of your videos. I've already yeah. subscribed. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Excellent thank you. work, man. So one of the things that happened is a lot of them kept saying, why aren't you doing a public event? Because I don't sell anything. Like, I'm not saying... Buy this package for six thousand dollars. I'm not selling anything. I mentor five CEOs, and I I don't deal with anything else. And you know, I don't. I, I intentionally say such a big number that they say no, and they go away. Because if you saw what I'm looking at here on the other side with the business, and if you saw my schedule, you would say this guy's going nonstop. But I am hosting a three day conference that has to do with purely entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, executives. That's what it is. And at three-day conference, I'm hosting it in Dallas, Texas. I'm the main person speaking. This isn't one of those things that you go to where 30 speakers speak and they're all selling their book or their packages. Like, oh, let me spend 800 more dollars here, three more thousand dollars here, 2,000. No, no, this isn't what that is. It's three days, you're with me. There's gonna be entertainment. I'm bringing a few interesting speakers that'll be at this event. We're gonna process exactly the formula of how to win during good times and bad times. We're going to figure out exactly every single one of your trends and everybody at different levels is going to lead the conference knowing their next three moves and uh, uh, recruiting strategies, uh, next innovative campaign strategies, how to come up with your next innovative campaign, leadership development, team building. It's a three-day conference. It's called The Vault. If somebody wants to find out about it, it's actually, a, we have five packages. The highest package, CEO package, just sold out, uh, which is going to be a lot of one-on-one time with me. It was 25, see, we sold 31. The second one is founder package. It's 75 seats. There's only two left. That's going to sell out in the next 24, 48 hours. But then the rest of them, we still have some tickets. It's called value. You can go to valuetainment.com for all the details there. But this has nothing to do with insurance, nothing to do with PHP. None of my agents are invited to this conference. None of them. So this isn't like, hey, you know, let me also get my agents. There's zero. I don't double dip. My agents are one side. Right. But um, this has to do with success. 100%. 100%. This has to do with every, listen, one of the things every time people in the industry call me and they come over here and they want to see the data, the one question everybody asks the following question, how have you guys grown 15 quarters in a row in life insurance policies being sold? Let me say this again, 15 consecutive quarters, we have sold more policies this quarter than prior quarter. I'm not talking a year. Year is easy because you could have two bad quarters and still beat prior year. Right. Quarter is hard. 15 quarters we've gone beating prior quarter and policy count. Everyone's trying to figure that part. That's amazing. Yeah. And I think the challenge sometimes is people don't have the right strategies and formulas in, but once you figure out those right strategies and formula, it's immediately being applied to your business as well. So I'm going to open up and talk about all this stuff with everybody while they're at the conference. Patrick, thank you so much for joining us on spot on. It's uh, been enlightening to say the least. Uh, And of course I, as I said, We've already subscribed and we're following your channel. You have some wonderful, wonderful information. So for our listeners, tune in there. Valuetainment, right? Valuetainment. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And Thank I think you. uh, you're going to be having that conference at a beautiful venue, which I believe is the Hyatt Regency. It is. It it's is. the Hyatt Regency and it's a beautiful place. It's got the ball, the Wolfgang restaurant all the way at the top. 
Uh, it's in Dallas, Texas from May 1st to May 4th. May 1st to May 4th. It's very hands-on. Like I'm going to be walking in the audience, looking at people's plans. Very, very hands-on conference. Beautiful right. building, especially at night. Thank you, Patrick, for joining us today. Thanks for having me, guys. Truly, thank you. Thank Fantastic. you. Any questions about the Tax Act 2022, hit us up and we'll talk to you a little bit more about life in Puerto Rico.